So when you were faced with this massive task, before you'd ever done it, of um, updating what is a very well-loved and useful reference book, but old mm. now, what did you do? How did you go about it? I spent quite a lot of time immersed in the old book, which is wonderful and well-informed and eccentric and full of an amazing personality. I mean, I think it has such, it has such personality, that old book. Um, but as you say, it was very old. It's more than 30 years old. And the transformation in, in the world it's describing to the world that I was trying to describe was enormous. The first thing I did was put together a kind of draft list of what I thought should go in some individuals, but also some kinds of things. So I knew that young adult had to be represented in a way that it really wasn't in the old one. I knew that I wanted much more coverage of uh, non-UK writers and also non-English language writers. So I started getting a sense of the kinds of things I wanted to cover and then put together lists of every writer I could think of, every illustrator I could think of. I mean, I have, I have you know, spreadsheets within spreadsheets within spreadsheets. Um, and then began slowly to make decisions about what I was going to include. Um, partly it was about thinking, you know, is this person someone I want to include? But also thinking slightly more broadly, if I have quite a lot of this kind of person, I should make sure that this area is also covered as well. Because you want something, it's never going to include everybody. There are 3,460 entries, I believe. Um, he said with a sigh. Um, Good work, Doug. Yes, I'm done now. Um, there are more than 3,000 entries, which means that there is a lot in there, but it's still not going to include everyone. It's still not going to include everybody's favourites. So the idea was choosing things that were important um, and great, but also had to some extent to be representative, and it meant figuring out what was going to be excluded as well. Um, I, I already have things I uh, regret. I don't have anything I regret including. Um, Obviously, I wish I hadn't put you in, but mostly there, there are plenty of people I, I would have liked to, yeah. to include it. But one of the pr things that is a problem, of course, is attempting to make it more international. It also means that I can't just include a thousand UK writers if I'm not also going to include a thousand American writers and 500 New Zealand writers and 500 Irish writers. I can't, the more I, I increase one, I, I, I risk, this thing kind of risks becoming an absolute tidal wave of, of, of people. But there's something enormously satisfying about creating, about creating a picture like this, about creating this kind of composite picture and trying to figure out how things are represented. Um, and also being able, to share, uh, being able to share enthusiasms for things. One of the things that I love about the, the, the predecessor to this book, and I hope this one, is that it's not just uh, data, as it were. It doesn't just say Gillian Cross, this is the year she was born and this is the bibliography of Gillian Cross. It talks about what I think is exciting and what I think is interesting and what I think is influential. So it's quite opinionated and quite personal. But that means that from my point of view, I'm not just collecting data and then you know lining it up and publishing it. It's actually about thinking about what I like and about attempting to share um, a kind of passion and a view. And is there in there an author you feel is unjustly neglected that you would like to see more? There are so many authors I feel are unjustly <laughs> neglected. I think most authors are unjustly neglected. Most authors I would like to get more attention than they have. Um, there are a lot of people in there who are, who are real favourites of mine who aren't. Someone like Hilary McKay, I think, is an astonishingly good writer. And she is sort of known, and she's read, and she's won. She won the Whitbread a few years ago. But I think she should be a superstar. I think she should sell billions of everything. I think Geraldine McCorkran should sell billions. I assume she doesn't, I don't know. I think, I'm sure you should sell more than you do. I think a lot of people who are really good writers should be selling more than they do. Um, and there's also a fashion thing, isn't there? So one of the writers that you have in there that I think is unjustly neglected these days is Antonia Forrest, yes. who writes in a, a straight boarding school story is a very unfashionable genre without mm -hmm. magic. But her characters are so extraordinary, I think. I well, she's, she's someone who, she was included in The Old, in the old Companion, obviously. Um, and there are a lot of people who are included in The Old Companion who, in a way, their time has passed, just from a sales point of view and from a kind of awareness point of view. But I thought it was really important to keep those people even though I don't think people read her now. Because I think, first of all, there is a lot of quality to to do the to the 
the books, but also, I think, someone who was that important once is an important part of the story, even if you don't see them in the shops now, I think. There are a lot of people uh, from the old companion whom I kept who seemed promising at some point in the 60s and 70s and maybe didn't uh, have the success that we would have hoped they would have. But even them, even they are included, because I think there is a danger with these things that it becomes very contemporary, it becomes very driven by fashion, it's very much about what is on the bestseller list, and you kind of forget where you came from, and you kind of forget all the writers who influenced the really great or not great, but big, big and kind of visible writers now.